So first, I, I want to thank everybody for being here. I'm excited to share this work. Um, for the past two years, I've been working on this project with many of you, uh, PRISM leaders and others, to develop a new tool specifically tailored to the needs of managers in New York. And I want to thank everybody first, you know, this has been, this, this project has relied heavily on the involvement of the DEC and the prison leaders. And without their assistance, I don't think we would have come up with such a, a great product in the end. It's been heavily reliant on their participation. So I want to thank them first and foremost. So in the last two years, I've grown a huge appreciation for what you guys are tasked with. And that is trying to minimize negative impacts of invasive species with very limited budgets. First of all, there are so many species to consider. Over 250 in New York are candidate species for management. And there are a lot of things to consider with each of those species, including biological characteristics that affect their invasibility, also their distribution across New York. And then space matters a lot. You have to consider how space affects your decision making, including where you should implement management in order to protect the resources that we care about, such as native species and agriculture. Also considering invasion pathways that facilitate the spread and establishment of, of those invaders. And then also treatment effectiveness and cost varies across species and even across treatments as well. Further, there's a massive amount of uncertainty, including where species are actually located and where they're not located, and the ability of management actions to actually reduce their impacts. So even if we can, and how that also translate reduced impacts to the things we care about. So for example, even if we implement management on an infestation and we're able to reduce that infestation, how does that translate to reduced impacts to native species? So just a little, a quick background, I think most everybody here is familiar with the New York system, but just in case not, about every year, $13 million in EPF funds, those environmental protection funds, are allocated for invasive species management. And much of that, or, and a lot of that is allocated among our eight different prisms or eight different regions. And again, there are over 250 candidate species to consider for allocating those very limited resources. In 2015, NISRI, the New York Invasive Species Research Institute, sent out a survey to identify research needs for New York. And one of the research needs identified that year was the need for a priority setting tool. Some tool that would help managers consider those, those over 250 species across their regions and help them decide how they can get the biggest bang for their resource dollars. The first thing this project tackled was to determine if there was an existing tool that would meet the needs of New York managers. And many of those tools are prioritization approaches. And prioritization is any approach that rank, that can produces a ranking, like a list or a hotspot area, based on predetermined criteria. And so one example of a species specific prioritization approach are the New York Invasive Species Assessments, which score species based on their invasibility, on their impacts, and other traits. Example on his based prioritization would be New Hampshire's Picking Our Battles project, where on the left you have these spatial data sets that represent ecological significance, potential for invasives to spread to new areas, and also ecological services. These spatial layers are then weighted to produce this hotspot map where the areas in dark red are where we'd want to implement management in order to minimize impacts of invaders. Now, there are a lot of advantages of prioritiz prioritization approaches, specifically that they're simple, relatively simple to complete, and you can compare, compare many species or areas fairly easily. However, they often treat species management actions as independent, and ultimately one of the biggest setbacks is they don't actually tell you how to allocate your resources across that list of species or across that hotspot map. So for example, if you have a given budget, how do you know which of the dark red areas in this map you should target first and how much you should allocate to each one of those areas? The approach that we've used is called structured decision making and it's one of many decision aiding frameworks that basically structures your whole approach 
to a decision. It's objectives focused and transparent. And what I mean by objectives focused is really that we structure the decision around achieving the things that we value most. So often when you get a bunch of people in a room to make a decision, everybody already has an idea of the action that they want to see implemented. What SDM and many of these decision aiding approaches do is they make you take a step back and think, okay, well, what do we value? Why do we want to make this decision in the first place? So it starts out with identifying a problem. What do you actually want to, or what, do you, what is the reason that you're considering making a management decision in the first place? You then identify objectives. And so these are the values-based reasons that you want to implement management. And for invasive species, objectives would be minimizing impacts of invasive species to native species, for example, or minimizing impacts of native or invasive species on agriculture. Then using this, this identified objectives, which are identified by decision makers and also stakeholders, we then use that to identify a suite of alternatives that can be taken to meet those objectives. Next, after we have the alternatives, we can consider the consequences of each one of those alternatives. So how our control of giant hogweed, for example, help us to minimize impacts of native species to, for example, human health. Then we use modeling and our different types of tools to consider trade-offs of trade-offs with how our alternatives are affecting our objectives. And then using kind of output, we can provide that to a decision maker to make a better informed decision. Structured decision making is a, a, guidance, a guidance, so it does not actually tell you this is what you have to do. It's ultimately up to the decision maker to consider those trade-offs and make the best informed decision. For our project, we had many of these SDM workshops to help us identify the problems, objectives, and alternatives. So we've been working primarily with the New York DEC and also the PRISM leaders, which each represent a wide diver a diversity of, of objectives for their region. So they have their own stakeholders and their stakeholders have we identified was, was how can managers allocate resources across invasive species, areas, and actions to reduce environmental, human health, and safety, economic, and social impacts of invasive species at the highest treatment effectiveness. And breaking this decision out even a little bit further, we decided that we wanted to consider allocating resources for five-year management actions. So in a given year, what five-year projects do we want to take on? And we considered a spatial scale of five by five kilometer blocks across the state, so using the breeding bird blocks actually, so that each decision ultimately tells us which species in which blocks to allocate resources for those five-year management actions. And some of the things we wanted to consider in this model were species occurrence data used, or which we got from IMAP invasives, Predicted spread, we wanted to consider, well, if we don't do anything, how bad, how, how will these species spread across the landscape? And then how is, will that translate to changes and impacts to the things we care about? We want to consider species specific impacts, how each one of our, the candidate species affects our objectives. And also we wanted to account for that variation across New York and the value of each objective. So, I wanted to include this management action cost. So specifically, how effective is this man action at achieving our objectives? So once we had our decision problem, we moved on to identifying the objectives, which were to minimize impacts of negative or negative impacts of invasive species to the environment which we broke out into minimizing impacts to native species, ecological communities, and ecosystem processes. We also wanted to minimize impacts of in, onto industry, specifically looking at minimizing impacts to agriculture and also forestry. And then we wanted to minimize impacts to recreation and human health and safety. We also wanted to do this, like I said before, at a maximum cost effectiveness. The next thing we had to do is that for each one of those objectives, we needed to identify data. So we needed to identify first the spatial layers that would represent the value of each block for each objective. 
And so here, for example, we have a native species map created by New York Natural Heritage Program. And so the areas in darker blue are areas where there are a greater number of rare native species. And so if this was the only objective we were managing for, we would want to allocate our resources to those dark blue areas. So this would be like a hotspot map. We then aggregated this information at the block level. And as you can see, over 2,500 blocks across the state of New York. Spatial, use spatial data sets that we use for each one of our areas. And even just looking at this, you can, you can visually see how there are automatically trade-offs. So if you wanted to, for example, um, if you're managing for both agriculture and recreation, but in most cases, a block is going to be good for either one or the other. So it can make, it can make a really big challenge to consider how to best allocate your resources when you have these conflicting objectives. So the more information that we needed, we were able to get from the DEC invasive species assessments. And so this, this has been an amazing source of information for our project. And the information that we've gleaned from them includes the severity of impacts on our ecological and socioeconomic objectives. So we use the ecological assessments as well as the socioeconomic assessments. This in, these assessments also have information on habitat types that these invasive species are found in, and also their invasion characteristics such as rate of reproduction and mode of dispersal. As I mentioned before, we are using ISIPs, and so here's an example of our description of giant hogweed and our block layer. And next, once we had these data gathered, we elicited or we determined which management actions we wanted to consider. And so initially we had identified 24 alternatives with the prison leaders in DEC, but we're eventually able to scale that back to three. And these can be better described as strategies that are made up of multiple specific actions that managers can take in a given block. So first we have no direct action. This would be in the recommended strategy in a block and would mean that we would be recommending to not expend any of our management resources in that given block for that given species. Second, we have search, destroy, prevent. These are actions that would be taken in a block for a given species where we do not have an observed occurrence point, but there's some probability that species is already there or that could be coming in the in the future. So these management strategies include searching for this, these species and then treating it if we find any infestations. It also includes prevention actions taken to reduce the probability that that block is infested. Oh, I gave it to Dave. And finally, we have direct intervention. These would be any management actions that we would take in a block that does have known infestations of a given species. So that would include any control or suppression actions directly taken on those infestations, as well as prevention efforts or anything to help minimize the probability that that infests neighboring books. I do want to point out that our model does not consider multi-species prevention measures or biocontrol, but I'll talk a little bit more about that later. Now, a lot of the data that we needed for this modeling approach was not readily available. However, with working with the prison leaders, they have a lot of information we were able to utilize. And so we were able, for example, to ask them about management effect effectiveness and get their best judgment. So for one example, we asked them about how treatment effectiveness varies for different levels of abundance in a block. So here we have on the left, these are little diagrams representing the level of, of abundance in that block. So we have a low abundance infestation, this tiny little, this top block with a small infestation. Moderate level abundance, you can see that that infestation is spreading, and then a high abundance block. So for each one of these, we then ask managers levels of effectiveness. And so here for a low level block or level, low abundance block infestation, a species could either at this level of abundance have a treatment effectiveness that was not very effective, semi-effective, or very effective. 
And then these numbers within each cell represent the probability that that, uh, that treatment would be effective at mitigating or minimizing impact. And so for not very effective, that means that for that low level abundance for that species, there's only a 30% chance on average that management is going to be effective. And as you can see, and then we, then we took this information, we used this chart to characterize each species. And so as you can imagine, this, is a really, this was a really big project. For each species and each level of a block level, each level of abundance, we had to characterize how effective treatment, is, treatment would be. Some of the other information that we harnessed from our expert were dispersal functions. And so basically we wanted to know, okay, if we don't do anything, how fast are these species going to spread across the landscape from known infestations? We achieved this using this web-based tool, it's called a Shiny app, where you can toggle the parameters on the left and that would show us how a species would spread across the landscape from a known infestation. So from on this plot, you can see the, the left axis is probability of infestation, and the zero is where we have like a known infestation. And then the different functions represents the probability that an infestation will spread further infestation. And so here we have an example of the dark, the black color would be a natural infestation, so maybe that's spread by wind and the gray would be anthropogenic spread. And then we can see how that looks across the landscape. And here we have a plot, we have three infestations, and then we have these little roadways. And so by changing these different parameters, we were able to visualize what that spread of each of those infestations would look like, including that natural spread, which gives that homogeneous circular spread, as well as spread along these invasion pathways. You guys still hearing me okay? Yeah, every once in a while they'll, we'll miss a few words, but I hope that people can follow <laughs> along from your slides um, and then you seem to come back. So keep going. We'll see how, we, how yes, it goes. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> Sounds good. Yeah, if you just flag it and we can come back and chat about it more at the end of, you know, once I get through it all. Okay, so just as a quick summary before I, I delve into how the model works. So we have our species specific data, which includes tier classification for each of our species, dispersal parameter values we got from that web-based tool, impacts to the objectives, which we got from our, the New York Invasive Species Assessments, effects of management action, so for example, how effectiveness are control efforts at reducing impacts of native species, and then cost of management, and IMAP occurrence locations. And then for each block across New York, we have information on the value of that block for each one of our objectives, and also the value of that block as an invasion pathway. So is it an area where that it's frequented by people or that has lots of roadways or such and such. So to our general management model, so using this information, we simulate what happens under those five years if we do nothing first. So here we have three infestations indicated by the stars. And then as you can see, these infestations are spreading over time. And this is again our no action simulation. <clears throat> and yes, so the lighter areas are areas where there's a greater probability of infestation. And here we, and for each one of the blocks, we would calculate the impacts based on the value of each block for the objective, the severity of the impact of each species on each objective, and then also the infestation status within each block. Is it infested, yes or no? And the weight of each objective. So one thing I didn't mention before is for those objectives, we also allowed DEC to give different weights on those. So for example, there is a greater weight on minimizing impacts of um, of invasive species on native species than there is for minimizing impacts on recreation. <clears throat> so for each one of these blocks and each species and each objective, the value can range from zero to one. And so a block with an, a, around a zero is represented by this top left block. 
So here you can see this block has a very low probability of becoming infested. And let's also assume it has little value for our objectives. So it would be closer to zero. However, this block indicated in red, <clears throat> where we have a known infestation, and let's also say it's really valuable for native species, would fall much closer to one. And then we can sum all of the, all of the values across all of the blocks for each species and objective. And here we have, then we can calculate how much impact the species causes across the landscape for our no action and no budget scenario. So here, let's say these are our total impacts of that species across all blocks and all objectives. Hello? I think we're getting some feedback. If um, everybody could make sure that they're muting their lines. Um, you can go ahead, Jennifer. Okay. All right, so again, do nothing alternative. So here are total impacts without any management. The next thing we want to do is simulate what happens to those infestations and to a, how much can we reduce the total impact of that species when we do implement management. So how, we, how our model works is we first allocate a given budget and then we have an optimization algorithm that determines how much we can minimize impacts for that given budget. So here is an example of our optimal management under a given budget. So here you can see we have our three initial infestations, but when we're implementing management, say we're implementing direct intervention on those three infestations, and then search, destroy, prevent on neighboring infestations. Here you can see that the probability of infestation is much smaller and many fewer blocks are being negatively impacted. We again total up the impacts for this scenario across all objectives for the species. And then we can see how much we've been able to minimize impacts given that budget. So here we go. And now you see we've minimized it, but there's still a lot of impacts from that species. We then do this many more times given many more budgets. And by doing that, we're able to see how much we can reduce overall impacts for many different budget scenarios and eventually get this budget impact curve. So as you can see in this example, for our first two budget allocations, we have a pretty significant reduction in impacts. However, once we're allocating more resources, we're not getting near as much bang for our buck. We're still minimizing impacts, but the slope is not near as steep. So we elicit, are we solve for the species specific budget impact curve. So we run the same optimization approach for many different species. Once we have for each of our candidate species, we then think about, okay, well, what's the most cost effective way to allocate resources across many invasive species? And so here we have three example species, species A, B, and C. And we saw this similar to a knapsack problem in the optimization world where we start first by allocating resources to the species with the most steep slope. So that represents, or that is indicated by species three here, where you can see that for a small budget, we're gonna have a substantial reduction in the total impacts of that species. However, after a little while, that slope does begin, that curve does begin to level off. And so once we reach this point, we're gonna start allocating species, we're gonna start allocating resources to species B. And then once that, begins to level off or is not as steep, we'll allocate resources to species A. So I'm gonna show you guys what this looks like. And so, because it was a little bit overwhelming to look at a, like over 200 species on a slide, I'm gonna show you a smaller example with a budget of $200,000 for five species. So here we have initial infestations of five species. We have mile a minute, kudzu, as you can see, they're in their distribution and they're more widely distributed. Yep. Oh, uh, we were losing yep. you. <laughs> okay. So, this, you want me to repeat this slide? Uh, if you could. 
Sure, yeah. <clears throat> so I'll just repeat it all again. Um, because it was a little bit too cluttered to put about over 200 species on this, I'm gonna show you a smaller example with five species in the lower Hudson, allocating a budget of $200,000. And here we have five species, and these are the distributions across the lower Hudson. We have kudzu, giant hogweed, and scotch broom, which are more restricted in their distribution. And then we have more widely uh, distributed mile a minute and emerald ash borer. So once we use our optimization for optimization tool for these five species, I'm gonna show you the recommended strategy of how we would allocate that $200,000 across those five species. And, here's, and here is the actual result from that optimization run. So here, the first thing I want you to look at is that for our more limited distribution species, we're allocating most because uh, there's a lot bigger bang for the buck. We can still, they're still not very widely distributed, and we can reduce their spread across the prism more effectively. And the darker blue, I'm sorry, is direct intervention. And then in the yellow, we have search, destroy, prevent. So this model produces a management action for each species within each given block. So most cells you can see, given $200,000, we can't treat very many of them. And so most, for most species and most blocks, the recommended strategy is no direct action. I'll also point out that once we finished allocating resources for kudzu giant hogweed and scotch broom, then we move on to mile a minute and we try to reduce the spread there. So you can see these two yellow dots are areas where there are invasion pathways and we're trying to reduce the spread of mile a minute into those highly valuable blocks. And finally, you'll see that we don't allocate anything to the dashboard. A big reason for that is it's not very cost effective to manage because it's already widespread it's also a very fast spreader. And so we're not gonna get a whole lot of bang for a buck. It would take a lot of money in order to have a big reduction in impact for that species. I do wanna also reiterate and um, emphasize that this is a very, this is a regional management tool. And so even though we're not recommending, or this tool is not recommending any resources for animal or ash borer, that is specifically for these five by five kilometer blocks. And that does not mean at a finer scale, perhaps a municipality, that it would not be cost effective or valuable to implement management actions. So what are we finding from this optimization tool? Well, ultimately it's revealing a lot of cost efficiency trends and that at our scale of management, we rarely manage this widespread species because they're expensive and once they're in high abundance in those blocks, they're very inefficient to treat. There's also a constant pressure of reinvasion. So even if we do reduce a, a abundance in one block, there's a, light, there's a pretty high probability that a neighboring block is going to continue to be a source of new, in, of new infestations. So we're also finding the control may be the only option for regional cell management. So again, we do by a model that may be the most cost-effective means for some of these widespread species. We're also finding that the spatial consideration does affect the allocation of decision, the allocation of resources, specifically highlighting the areas we want to implement search, to destroy, search destroy, prevent in order to protect those spatial assets, those native species and things we care about. Another big finding from all of our work has been to, that we need to move beyond presence only data. While it's useful, apps, abundance data in, particularly, in particular would be incredibly valuable. It is incredibly valuable because as I walked through before, in the level of abundance in a block or a given species, um, Other information that would greatly increase the value of this model and help us better inform our decisions would be absence data. So we, for, we definitely know where species are not located, survey effort, and then more research on how management actions directly influence ecological and socioeconomic objectives 
So not just how changes in an infestation and abundance level translate infestation levels, but also how those reductions in infestation level translate to minimizing impact on native species and the things we care about. So just in sum, I think our approach is leading, can lead to more informed invasive species management decisions. It's, it, I think it was useful for everybody to go to think more broadly about what the decision was and what our values-based objectives are for management. Also evaluating alternatives relative to the objectives is something that our model is enabling people to do more effectively. And our model considers multiple species, areas, and objectives. Currently, I'm working with NatureServe. I'm very excited about this. So I, I know that a lot of people have new modeling tools and they all seem great, but in the end, they're not utilized because they're just difficult to implement. And for example, our model is in, it's coded up in C++ and it required, and it was developed by computer scientists. And it's just not very effective to go to a computer scientist every time you need to run a model like this. So one thing that was very important to all of us was to make sure that we could integrate the tool into a user-friendly interface so that you wouldn't end up needing me or a computer scientist to run it. What we've done is we worked with NatureServe, we partnered with them, and we're implementing the tool within IMAP Invasives directly. So here we have, this is just a screenshot of IMAP Invasives, and we envision a module that will allow users to run the model, display results, and then basically able to highlight specific blocks, and then print out lists of species and recommended strategies for those species, and then also allow users to print out species-specific management maps. So here again, we have Lower Hudson, and this is a map for Russian olive and a recommended strategy for each block. Again, huge thanks to the team and also to my powerhouse of lady uh, co-authors. It has been a, a very long effort, you know, but I'm very excited and, and proud of the things we've been able to accomplish in such a short time. So I want to thank them again for all their work and also to the DEC, CompSusNet, and NSF for their funding and expertise. With that, I will put it out to you guys for questions. And if there's something I need to go back over because my audio is glitchy, then please, please let me know. <laughs>